the way the development went, it was, look, let's make 500 horsepower the first year. And then every year after that, we try to make another 100 horsepower. And then eventually when we made the horsepower that we wanted, we said, let's make another 1,000 RPM. We just evolved it a little bit each year. And then we would find a challenge and, and uh, try to design around it or design straight through it. Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast, I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode we've got Stefan Papadakis from Papadakis Racing joining us. For those who haven't heard of Papadakis Racing, Stefan is known for his background in drag racing. He was one of the pioneers of front-wheel drive import drag racing back in the day, and uh, just for one, I was really inspired by what was happening in the import drag racing scene around the time he was involved, and that was one of the things that really spurred me into doing what I now do, owning my own shop and, and now running High Performance Academy. I know that Stefan has also inspired inspired thousands if not hundreds of thousands of other people more recently with his YouTube channel where he gets into some really detailed rundowns on engine building and the strengths and weaknesses of different engines as well as what goes into building a professional winning formula drift car. On that note Stefan builds and runs Frederick Aspo's Formula Drift GR Supra, prior to that his Scion TC, then his Toyota Corolla and this season is also running uh, Ryan Turk's GR Corolla which won on debut at Long Beach not that long ago. This is a really deep dive into all things mechanical, in particular we talk about the 2AR Toyota engine which powers the Toyota Corolla. GR Corolla of Ryan Turk and previously also powered the Scion TC Toyota Corolla that uh, Frederick Aspo drove and this is an unusual choice in the world of Formula Drift we're talking about a 2.7 litre four cylinder engine uh, in a sea of 2JZs and LS turbo combinations punching out a thousand plus horsepower this is uh, an engine that is punching well above its weight and we talked to Stefan about what goes into building Building a reliable engine at that level. We also talk about some of the ins and outs of developing a competitive package in Formula Drift. Finding out that it's not all about power and tuning the power output to the driver's preference as well as the particular venue that they're drifting at. And before we get into our interview with Stefan, just a quick introduction for those who aren't aware of High Performance Academy. We are an online training school. We specialize in teaching people how to build performance engines, tune engines, as well as build quality, reliable wiring harnesses. We also cover other topics, including race driver education, car setup, data analysis, and even fabrication. All of our courses are delivered via online video lessons that you can take from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection giving you the freedom to learn from the comfort of your own place and you can also learn at your own pace. Once you've purchased any course from us it is yours for life, it never expires, you can re-watch it as many times as you like. Now because today's topic dives deep into the world of engine building a couple of our courses that I think would be really applicable to those who enjoy today's chat are our engine building fundamentals course and our practical engine building course. These courses will teach you everything that you need to know about specking and assembling a quality performance engine. Doesn't matter what type of engine it is, whether it's a 2AR like Stefan's building today or maybe you've got a twin turbo LS7, it doesn't matter anything in between. In particular our practical engine building course breaks the entire engine building process down into a simple bite sized 10 step process and I know that when faced with uh, a pallet of fresh parts ready to assemble it can be a bit daunting knowing what to do first and where to even get started that 10 step process takes the mystery away and in no time you've got a completely assembled engine that's ready to start for the very first time. Now as a podcast listener you can also use the coupon code PODCAST75 and that will get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. We'll put a link to that coupon code and the two courses that I mentioned in the show notes. All right, let's get into our interview with Stefan now. 
All right, welcome to the podcast, Stefan. Thanks heaps for joining us today. Now, for those who maybe haven't heard the name Stefan Papadakis or Papadakis Racing, uh, can you give us maybe a, a brief background on how you got involved in working on cars? Sure. So when I was, geez, 12, 13 years old, I was really into RC cars, radio controlled cars. And uh, I was racing them and at that age, I was like, I want to be a professional RC car driver. And, you know, loved building the cars, loved tweaking on them. Uh, and then by the time I got 15, 16 years old, had some friends that had real cars and they were modifying them and, and racing them and stuff and realized, oh, that's more fun to drive in the car than to, you know, remote control them. Uh, and and they were going to like the street races and drag racing. And, and I started getting involved in a bit of that uh, scene just because in Los Angeles, there weren't any racetracks and stuff like that. Uh, but soon they did start opening some drag strips at Terminal Island, Pomona. They started having some street legal drags and uh, really got hooked. And I could make changes to my car and see the improvement in elapsed time. See the quarter mile time going down, you know, just driving and also modifying the car, launching it different, all those different things. And next it was, okay, I want to be a professional race car driver. <laughs> and, uh, and really just pointed in that direction. Uh, after high school, uh, I didn't really see any college education that was going to send me in the direction that I wanted to eventually be. So I worked uh, right out of high school at a place that built racing car engines. And uh, first started sweeping the floor and answering the phone and and eventually started, you know, uh, helping out customers and stuff with technical questions, and all at the same time racing my car at this on the side. After a few years there, and really, really being in the scene and having a lot of other friends that worked at shops and were at the cutting edge of the import tuner market, uh, opened up a shop, and what we specialized in was engine swaps. So. Integra engines and C Civics or CRXs, Prelude engines. So put the bigger engines into the smaller cars and understanding how to make the axles work and the wiring and the different ECUs and shift linkage and all of different things. Uh, so learned a lot on the different uh, systems in a car, you know, the electrical systems, the fluids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but still racing uh, in parallel at the same time, uh, really Kind of coming to a point around, geez, what would that be? Probably 90, 99 or so, 98. Uh, when when buddy of mine, the late Sean Carlson, uh, and I built a tube chassis front wheel drive drag race car. And it was like, okay, we can kind of basically go on tour and start doing all the battle imports and the drag races with this car uh, or really focus on the shop and working on customers' cars. It was going to be difficult to do both. And at that time, I was you know, 22 years old or whatever, 23 years old and uh, unmarried, no kids and said, man, this is when I can do this. Let's go racing. Let's make this happen and closed the shop and just focused on uh, drag racing and trying to continue to have these front wheel drive drag racing records. And at that, that same moment when is when the, the whole scene really started to explode with magazines and DVDs and, and just the whole scene really started getting popular and a bit of a lot, a, 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 this next generation of racers or drag racers were coming up that were modifying import cars and sport compact cars and front wheel drives. And we were kind of leading that new generation of, of racers. As I see it, because I watched that develop, and I mean, your, your car and some of the others that were racing at that time probably is, is what actually got me involved, got me hooked into drag racing and I kind of went down a similar path of starting my own shop really as a way of, of making my own car go faster. But I, I think it's fair to say this was kind of the, the sweet spot in the import scene in terms of drag racing. Uh, the popularity of it was so huge uh, at that time. And particularly the front wheel drive uh, sort of platforms, we, we saw a lot of effort and time and money being poured into making these front wheel drive cars do something they really were never designed for. Uh, and the the Civic that you're talking about there that uh, was, was built with Sean Carlson, from what I recall, that, that was a bit of a, a history setter. I think it was the, the first front wheel drive into the nines and then the first into the eights as well, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. And we were doing it at a time when 
we were looked at by the traditional drag racers as completely ridiculous trying to run these front wheel drive cars and go quicker. Uh, and, and they had these arbitrary barriers, you know, they can't run, you, you technically can't run a front wheel drive car faster than 13, uh, second quarter mile, then 12 second and 11 second. Like there was these, like the way the, like these theories of, well, you'll be accelerating so hard that you'll transfer the weight off of the front tires. And then you just can't accelerate any faster. They were all wrong. Um, and then, you know, now they're into the, you know, seven second, no problem. Uh, and, and, but there was this moment where it was like the right place at the right time. And we were blazing a trail and the, we were the, a small group of experts that really even didn't even know that much, but it was such a new form of motorsport or drag racing that nobody knew how to make a front wheel drive car do something like that. Cause no one had. I think all you really need to do is know just a little bit more than the person who's racing you in the other lane and, and you're probably good to go there. Um, but yeah, definitely an exciting time and in, in, in being at the forefront. Uh, I mean, I'd like to think we were at the same point with the four-wheel drive stuff that we were involved with back back in the day. And uh, definitely when, when you're sort of leading the way, it, it, it is very rewarding. However... Obviously, drag racing has incredible highs and incredible lows as well. So it's not all plain sailing, of course. And uh, anyone who's been drag racing for a time is going to beat up on some parts. I'm, I'm interested in the skill sets that you brought to your drag racing and, and how how the drag racing helped you develop. Obviously, you said you you started working for a race engine builder. So uh, I have no doubt you you developed a lot of your engine building skills. Uh, learning in that shop but th there's a lot that goes into this you know you've talked about the engine conversions as well with the Honda but uh, then there's engine management tuning as well suspension tuning you know, what what would you say your sort of key skill sets were at that point in time and, and what did you learn from the drag racing I, I I think above all the main skill set is to understand the project as a whole and being able to complete it within a budget and a time frame and, able, and, and start a foundation to build upon. Uh, I had so many friends that they just couldn't get the car to the track. They couldn't get it finished for whatever reason. Uh, it could be budget. It could be whatever. Uh, but I really believed in get, to, get it to the track, start with something, and then evolve it from there. And the history in my experience of working in the shop and doing these these transplants and stuff was a great foundation for that because we had customers that needed their cars. They needed to drive around a lot of more street cars and they needed to be finished and they wanted to they to be finished for the price that we quoted them and they needed to be able to drive around and be reliable. And, you know, sometimes there were problems and that was normal. They'd come back and we'd, you know, fix it for them and update it. And the next car that we would work on uh, would be a little bit better because we would learn from it. And I used that same philosophy with uh, with going racing as well. It was finish the car, get to the track, let's baseline it, figure out a list and what we want to improve on, come back to the shop, get those done, go back to the shop, or sorry, go back to the track and then uh, hopefully continue to improve. That's actually a really good point. And, and I do see this uh, happen a lot. I've been probably guilty of it in the past as well, where you're working on a project and you're trying to basically make it the the, the best and, and baddest thing in the world right from the outset. But the situation is is that probably when you're starting a project like like your drag car, you, you don't even know what you don't know. And then there's budget constraints as well that everyone has, no matter what level you're working at, there's a, there's a budget that you're working with. So I think that it's always smart if you can actually get the car finished to a point where you can go and race it, baseline it, as you say. Then you're going to start learning the areas of, of strengths and weaknesses of that particular chassis. No, and no matter what you're racing, drag racing, circuit racing, rally, it's, it's always the same. And then it's that issue of improvement and you're going to learn so much more, so so much more quickly, and also probably have a hell of a lot more fun than spending three seasons working away in, in your in your shop building the ultimate car, only to get to the track and actually find out that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you overlooked anyway. So I think uh, for those maybe working away on a project at the moment, maybe try and uh, incorporate some of that advice because I guarantee you're going to stay more focused, more uh, motivated, and have a lot more fun in the end. I, I don't 
the the interview here with you isn't really based on your drag racing but as I mentioned it's hard to sort of have a conversation without at least focusing a little bit on this because that is uh, you, you're very well known for that and that sort of formed your path in uh, racing and uh, and Papadakis Racing's sort of come out of that uh, before we move on from it I'm just interested in the engine choice for that Civic because you're running the H22A Prelude engine interested why you went that way over the B series is this just a, a displacement aspect and for those who are about to pipe up and ask why you didn't K swap it well obviously back then the uh, the K series wasn't uh, an option so yeah can you give us some feedback on your engine choice sure so this is back in uh, 1997 so the cutting edge Honda engines at that time were the older B16A 1.6 liter VTEC uh, at that time there was the the GSR so the 1.8 liters and um, the 2.2 and 2.3 liter Prelude engines. The 2.3 was the non VTEC, and the 2.2 was the VTEC engine. And after n- understanding a bit more of that, the H uh, series of engines, the H22, H23, uh, I learned that we could use the H23 bottom end, so the crankshaft with the longer stroke, but with the VTEC better flowing cylinder head. And in my uh, experience, you know, and in the old saying, there's no replacement for displacement. So it it was, you know, for that size, considerably larger, uh, 2.3 over 1.8. Uh, and uh, when I, my one of my philosophies with engine building was do the least amount that you need to change the least amount of variables, or, you know, make the least amount of variables. So the Prelude 2.2 liter cylinder head and 2.3 liter block gave a large displacement, a higher horsepower baseline. It was a closed deck uh, block, so it didn't have that floating liner. Uh, so I believed it was a, a stronger a block. And uh, so we really, what we did was we put, I put rods, pistons, I used the stock head gasket, and we, you put brand new head bolts in it, uh, stock cams, and then it was a slightly ported head uh, with valve springs and retainers. It was very simple, and it was made you know, 650 and later closer to 800 horsepower relatively easily. And it was easy to replace. It was easy to build. It didn't require, at, which was a big problem at the time, uh, a lot of machine work, which was uh, sometimes inconsistent and sometimes just straight up not good. Uh, and I didn't understand what was happening with the machining enough to instruct the machine shop to do a better job. So I just sort of stayed away from it. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Less, less is often more. I mean, I, again, people listening to this have to understand that this is back, as you say, 1997. The numbers you're talking now, 600 horsepower, even 800 horsepower, um, th- there's probably people getting around with that in, in modified street cars. So it, in today's terms, it's not massive numbers, but the turbo technology that we had available back then, as well as the, the uh, engine management systems, you know, they're, they're a lot more limited than what we have access to. So definitely back then it was harder to to make that sort of power. And uh, I suspect probably if you'd been shooting for a thousand plus horsepower back then with that platform, it would have required a, a lot more extensive modification. And given what you've mentioned about problems with machining, that may have caused uh, more trouble than it was worth. Now, Let's move on from from that. And these days, you know, you, you, you're really well known for uh, your work, particularly with Frederick Aspo in uh, Formula D. Frederick, uh, most winningest driver in Formula D history. And uh, we've already actually had an interview on the podcast with Frederick. And for those who are interested in getting the, the driving side, he's also a very technically minded guy. So there's a lot of really good uh, content that's probably going to cross over between these two interviews. And we'll drop a, a link in the show notes that can pe- people can follow if they want to listen to Frederick's interview. So what I'm interested for a start is uh, how how did you get involved with drifting? How did you make that transition? Because what we saw almost around the world was that import drag racing sort of exploded, went to a massive high, was super popular for a, a number of years and, and then it's definitely faded away as drifting came on the scene. Did you sort of see that happening and, and actively make the jump to drifting i i don't know if i saw that coming maybe i saw that coming uh there there were several factors in me making a pivot away from uh, a drag um one was i had been drag racing since you know 16 years old and by the time i was in my you know mid 
20s, 10 years of drag racing, I felt like I wanted to do something different. And we were so successful at drag racing. I had these dreams of, oh, I can do whatever. I can go IndyCar racing. I could go, you know, road racing, all these other things. Um, I, it was, <laughs> uh, and I said, you know what? I want to go try that stuff too. So, you know, later on in, in, around mid 2000s, 2004 or so, 2003, uh, I started having fun doing other stuff. I'd had a, sh a shifter cart and started building a drift car, a Nissan 240, and like planned to start driving and learning another form and then potentially becoming a professional at that. It was harder than I had anticipated. And, um, you know, it, it ended up shifting a little bit different way, but but back to the, the drag racing. So after 10 years of going drag racing, we we're traveling all over. We were doing, you know, 12 or 13 events a year, which as far as a pro schedule is not that crazy. But for me, you know, uh, it was a lot of travel. And every time I traveled to another drag race track, it was another quarter mile strip of, you know, asphalt and concrete. And I just kind of wanted, I wanted a type of racing that was more dynamic than racing the same eight dudes every weekend and uh <laughs> i think the other thing the other thing that i i sort of found with the drag racing which when you you stand back and and look at it it just makes no sense you're spending more and more money on your car to spend less and less time in the driver's seat so yeah from a value for money perspective <laughs> the return on investment is incredibly low uh and yes it's an absolute rush uh to go down the drag strip where everything works and, and go really fast and beat whoever's in the other lane but your actual seat time for the money invested in the car is incredibly small so uh yeah i, I i've sort of pivoted away to to road racing and i love that you can go out and do a, a race that lasts for an hour and your seat time is obviously exceptional um drifting obviously falls somewhere in between those two extremes but um yeah is that sort of the a, a similar sort of concept that that you sort of concluded as well yeah and, and you know i love motorsports i love cars i love building engines and making horsepower and competing i love all these different things and it, it, i felt restricted by just doing the drag racing and wanted to do more i mean it was relatively simple uh and at that moment i had gone to a couple of the drift events where they had the d1 events uh here in the u.s and it was it was it was eye opening. Like there was this totally different new type of motorsport, and it really felt like 1997 again, where it was a it, it was a young sport with a thin rule book, and the people coming out to watch were really fans of drift. They weren't necessarily drifters, and uh, I, I saw drag, you know, shifting towards you know complicated, expensive cars, lower turnout at the events, very expensive, and really just being followed by people that were kind of hardcore into the, that specific import drag racing or sport compact drag racing, which it felt like over time was getting smaller and smaller. And we weren't, we weren't a very good show. You know, I've got the story of Pomona and probably, you know, 2004 when my mom came and uh, she came to watch me race. And she's out in the, you know, grandstands and it's a hot day and, and, uh, there was some oil downs and maybe a crash or something. And there was tons of downtime and no racing on the track. And she came back to the trailer and she's like, Hey, uh, you know, we're going to leave. It's just not that much going on here. And I was like, I understand. Thanks for coming by. And it was like this moment in my head where, man, I don't think we have a show anymore. And, uh, it was like this weird thing just for the, it was like happening for the racers. and. I, I I felt if this had to, if I want to continue to have longevity in a sport and continue to do this professionally, I need to do it somewhere where there's actually people that just buy tickets and want to watch it, not just the people competing in it. And drift was what felt like that sport. Um, so yeah, I I wouldn't say I dove in uh, right away, and and it was a couple of years of doing some drifting on the side while still doing the drag racing. Uh, later on, we built a Honda S2000 in 2005. And was I, I drove the S2000 in, what do we do, like four of the Formula Drift events. And at the same time, we had done nine or 10 drag racing events that year. Uh, so a pretty busy year. Um, and we had received more exposure with this drift car, doing a few of the events, and me not even doing very well driving, 
than all of the drag racing stuff that we had done that year. Uh, so as far as sponsorship, as far as, uh, as far as the partners that we work with within our team, it was ripe to have a conversation. Hey, why don't we take some of these, uh, our partners and why, why don't we move over to drift and, and we can do a two car team for the same cost as our one car drag race team. And, uh, I believe it's going to be uh, great for great exposure, a lot of fun. People really enjoy watching it and it's going to continue to grow from there. So in two thousand end of 2005, 2006, uh, retired from drag racing and, uh, started a hundred percent into to drift. And I realized that I couldn't go out there and win these events. Uh, so we needed to bring on an A driver. And at that same moment, uh, Tanner Faust, uh, who was, uh, already driving in Formula Drift was showing and being an excellent driver, but was having some challenges with the car that he was driving with some reliability. So we had talked, you know, through 2005 and and about maybe doing something. And then 2006, uh, yeah, we hit the ground running and we built a, a Nissan Z for him. And I was in the second car uh, in an S2000. Uh, the split between the the Honda and the the Nissan platform uh, was that a big learning curve for you? Obviously, up to this point, you're you're Honda through and through, and you obviously know that platform really well. So, how how hard was it uh, getting involved with something that's relatively foreign? Or you did mention the Nissan 240 that you you'd built as well. So, I guess it's not completely foreign. Well, once uh, you know when 2004. 2005 came around we had so much experience within the team building race cars from the ground up every aspect from you know brakes to chassis to, to everything uh, and we're at that point we're into our third tube chassis vehicle uh you know it was a real wheel drive twin turbo v6 making 600 1600 horsepower running six seconds in the quarter mile at you know 200 215 miles an hour and building these street cars, modified street cars for drift was um, very straightforward. Uh, so it, it wasn't challenging moving over. And in addition to that, the sport was so young and the understanding of suspension setup and chassis setup, uh, drivetrain, all of that was so, there were so many new builders. It, it, was, uh, it wasn't very difficult to get up to speed to be competitive. So essentially at that point in, in Formula Drift, the, the understanding of all of the componentry is maybe not as refined as it is now. So it's possible to come in as a new team and, and get up to speed reasonably quickly and be competitive. Whereas I can only assume now a brand new team wanting to step up to the plate and, and build a new car to compete, compete at the top end of Formula Drift would be very difficult, if not impossible, but very difficult. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think you, you, that, that's right. And uh, because they, we have to remember back in 2000, you know, four, 2005, when this drifting was just starting to come up in, uh, in the U.S., we were looking at Japan and what they were doing, trying to buy parts and copying their setups, what they were doing in, in Japan. And in Japan, it was pretty darn limited because there was only a couple of builders and a couple of key, key component suppliers uh, that were, and you have to remember, these cars were basically street cars. So someone would take a stock S chassis, like S13, Nissan uh, 240SX. They would put an SR20 turbocharged engine in it, in it. They would leave it on the stock ECU most of the time. You'd buy like an angle kit, which would just put some spacers in the steering rack so it had a little bit more angle and some kind of bolt-on shock spring package. Like it was super basic and the rest were some safety components. And even then a lot of the safety components weren't even mandated. You're out there a lot of the time without cages and, and maybe put some five point seat belts in the car. Uh, th that's sort of what I've seen from the sidelines. Obviously the, the drifting as a sport uh, started in Japan and when the US adopted it and, and really sort of went, went deep on drifting, what I saw from the sidelines was, you know, in the, in Japan, you're probably seeing drift cars with maybe, 
three to six hundred horsepower and back at that point the the old AE86 with the naturally aspirated 4 AGE still actually stood a chance and the US kind of adopted that obviously you look at what others are doing why reinvent the wheel and, and started probably there or thereabouts as you've just mentioned but you know rapidly over a, a fairly short period of time uh, the small displacement four cylinder engines were thrown away uh, with some exceptions which we'll talk about shortly and uh, you know big capacity uh, V8s with turbos and thousand plus horsepower sort of instantly became the norm. Uh, what what drove that so quickly compared to what had been the norm in Japan with relatively low power levels for so long? Yeah, there's a couple of key key car builders here in Drift. One was ASD that was doing all of I think it's ASD that was doing all the cars for Falcon. Uh, there was us and uh, I think maybe one other that were really leading the the charge on competitive drift cars. And we had all come from a traditional motorsports background here, not traditional, but a, a US American motorsport background. And when you started looking at all of these very expensive and hard to build uh, import engines. So at the time, uh, what would be popular to JZ and the SR 20 engines and, and things like that. Uh, it was a little bit different scene back then 15 years ago. There weren't people were drag racing and making a lot of power, but if you're trying to make 6 or 700 horsepower reliably weekend after weekend, uh, it was it was still a challenge and and you could go get basically a crate LS7 Chevy engine for a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the the actual effort to put it into the vehicle and end up with a more reliable setup and and that is the direction that uh, ended up being competitive for a little bit until we got closer to a thousand horsepower, and then it became challenging again to make a reliable, you know, LS-based engine. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I'm guessing the sort of a, a correlation here between the the power increasing and people learning more about suspension setup and getting more mechanical grip out of the the cars as well. Uh, maybe even the tire compounds that are available improving because. Yeah, I, I, everyone thinks of a, of a drift car is is going sideways and smoke pouring off the tires, which obviously they, they do exceptionally well. But um, the, these cars are, are still incredibly fast, and particularly the ability to to stay close on a chase run that requires mechanical grip and and a lot of power. Correct. So is that is that sort of the correlation between the two sort of advancing? You know, no no point having a thousand horsepower without the technology to actually be able to get that to the track and and, and make the car grip. Yeah, so th there are some misconceptions about drift. Um, we all have these stories about, oh, I used to, you know, do donuts in the parking lot on the snowy, you know, when, after it snowed or whatever. And, and so intuitively you think, okay, if I'm going to go drifting, I want a least amount of rear grip so the car's sideways. And for most stock cars, you know, sure, that definitely works. But on the competition level, the competitive level, uh, you need to be fast around the track. And the reason you need to be fast around the track is because the actual competition is when the tandem runs, uh, are, are, the eliminations happen, which is a tandem run, two cars. And you'll each do two, uh, two runs. Uh, the car number one will lead first, and then the chase car will chase. The lead car needs to be on the prescribed line by the judges, and the chase car needs to mirror that and try to stay as close as possible. Well, the leads car job is not only to stay on that line, but to try to get away from the chase car so he can't mirror him as well. And the chase car needs to keep up with the lead car, right? So there becomes a bit of a, a speed competition at that point. And very quickly we realized you want a good tire. You want to have good mechanical grip. But when you started doing that, that the cars became harder to drive because it didn't want to drift as much. So in order to combat the high levels of grip, you would go with very high levels of horsepower. So the driver would use his right foot. The more he put the right foot in, the more wheel speed he would get, the more he could reduce the rear grip to help keep the car sideways. But as you come into a turn, a decreasing radius turn, something where you want the car to have some grip and to not spin out and get around the corner on the line that you want, you need to have that grip. And uh, fundamentally, these are understeering, high grip vehicles with much larger rear tires than front. We're starting to move much closer to 50-50 weight distribution. Um, and we use the horsepower to keep the wheel spinning and to, to reduce the amount of grip. Just to give our, our listeners maybe some concept, 
what would uh, a current sort of um, leading formula drift car be able to run down the quarter mile in? Obviously, they're not optimized for that, but just to, just to give us some sort of performance data. Oh, uh, I mean, they're 10-second cars off of the drift track. Like, if you just don't even do anything, they're going to run 10s, and they're, they're going to be... And you get, remember that these tires are also DOT, minimum 200 tread wear, tread wear tires. They're not our compound tires. That's a, a series mandate. Okay, so d- just get a perspective on that, because a 10-second car, anyway you cut it, is is incredibly quick. So I just wanted to, to get some comparison there. All right, l- let's move uh, a little bit further forward to your, your relationship with Frederick Aspo, and, and how, did, how did that sort of start? Obviously, at this point, you, you're starting to, to build a name for yourself. So you know, how, how did you get involved with Frederick? Uh, towards the end of, geez, let me think here, uh, 2010 or so, uh, Tanner Faust was planning to really focus on his uh, rally cross, his international racing, which was going to have conflicts with uh, the drift events and basically plan to retire from drift. And so we needed to find another, another driver for that Scion seat. And I had originally talked to uh, uh, one of the other drivers, um, and he he wasn't interested, uh, who was a more established driver, and then talked to Frederick Osbo. And so up until that moment, I've watched every round of Formula Drift competition for the past, you know, five or six years, right? So I'd seen all the different drivers, all the different styles, and there were a few drivers that were just excellent. Like they are ahead of the car. They're they're not reacting to it. They are driving the car. And those would be Tanner Faust, Samuel Hubinet, uh, probably Reese Millen. Uh, and then when I saw Frederick Osbo come out and driving his old beat up Toyota Supra uh, with way too much angle to be competitive, but really being uh, present in the moment. And I, I don't know, I just... I can watch these drivers, what they're doing with the front wheels. And I can tell when they're ahead of, they're, they're driving the car. They're not reacting to what's going on. And Frederick was one of those drivers that I could just tell was, was excellent. Um, so during that last year that Tanner was, was, was uh, driving with us, uh, I approached Frederick at one of the events. I think it was some Sonoma, California, and just met, met the guy, talked to him a little bit. And uh, totally down to earth, Super stoked to be, you know, on the the form of the drift series, a hundred percent committed. You know, all the way here with his buddy from Norway, living in America, driving to the different form of the drift events. When he wasn't at the drift event, he's either working on the car or in some like homemade drifting simulator thing that they had made. Uh, living in a room that he rented in, you know, in in Los Angeles area, like he was all in, and I thought that you know a few different a few things could take him from having a lot of potential to being you know uh, extremely successful uh, one of them was a reliable car one of them was a good spotter and one of them just more time competing and uh, had just had a lot of faith in him Okay, well, I mean, that faith turned out to be um, well-founded as well. Again, uh, as I mentioned, winning a st- driver in Formula Drift. So uh, he's, he's obviously come good on uh, the faith that you placed in him. Now, you've got this relationship with uh, Scion at the time, now now Toyota. And the interesting thing for, that I wanted to talk about here is the choice of car that, that you're, you're running, Frederick, and in, initially the Scion TC. Which, I mean, if I had a, a shopping list of suitable candidates for a competitive drift car, I, I don't know if the Scion TC would be at the top of that list, not least of all because it's front wheel drive. Uh, that's not really going to work. And uh, really kind of designed from the ground up as a, as a sort of a grocery getter, sort of uh, pedestrian commute car, not a performance car car and su- as such so um, can, can you talk to us about the options that were available to you and why that TC became the, the go-to option so when we started working with Scion back in what was that six seven eight in 2009 um, they wanted us to use the Scion TC because that was the car that they were promoting uh, but they were pretty open to engines and the car that we built for Tanner Faust had a NASCAR uh, V8 that we decided to run in it well, after running that for a car for a couple of years, when we started working with Frederick, uh, Scion had uh, a new generation of Scion TC, their their second generation, and some conversations with them. They were like, "Hey, you know, we, you know, you guys are doing this rear wheel drive conversion. 
we'd like the car to you know be as a little bit more authentic, like as authentic as a real wheel drive converted car could be. Uh, could do you think you can use you know the four cylinder that comes in the car? And after doing some thinking about it, we uh, we thought it would be a good challenge. And at that moment, that was the car that was important for Scion. So you you say, okay, maybe you want a Corvette. It already comes with an LS engine, and you know it's basically a drift car off the lot. Well, when you're working with a partner, um, whether it's a car company or a tire company or whoever, uh, part of your job is to uh, use their product and and make it competitive and make it look good. And sometimes you you work with partners that have the best products that you would pay for anyway. And we have a bunch of those partners that we work with right now. It's 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 excellent. Uh, and sometimes it's a front wheel drive car that they want to take drifting because they feel like that's a, a good audience uh, and a good market for to market that vehicle. And I, I totally believe in that because a lot of folks like to watch drifting, but they don't necessarily are trying to drift on the way to the to the market or to school or to work, right? So uh, a Scion TC is an excellent car for for you know daily driving. And one of the big benefits of working with a, a team like Papadakis Racing and, and what, what our skill set is, is taking cars or engines um, or whatever it is and making it competitive. Like that's what I love to do. Uh, it's not as much fun if someone just hands you the most competitive driver and most competitive car and then you can just go beat everybody. Like that's not going racing to me. That's, you know, I don't know. I just like the challenge of how I'd like more challenging setups. So when they talked about using the four cylinder and and and, and using the, the again the Scion TC starting with front wheel drive, I thought it was a great challenge, and it, it turned out to be a, a huge challenge. Uh, but <laughs> when you have a partner like Scion that that understands that and continued to work with us as we had our our uh, challenges and disappointments, and eventually coming out with a championship car after you know three or four years, uh, it really solidified the relationship and, and it continues until today. Yeah, I'll probably go back and say my, my comment about it being a sort of a, a grocery get is probably a little bit unfair. Sion was sort of uh, Toyota's offshoot to kind of focus that youth market and, and it was an affordable and attractive car for for that market. I mean, not everyone's in a position where they're, they've got sort of a you know huge amount of disposable cash to go and buy a, a, a performance car straight off the car, car lot. So, you know, it, it definitely served a purpose. Now, the conversion to, to rear wheel drive, I won't focus so much on, on that. Obviously, um, you know, you, you, you've got a platform there in a rear wheel drive format that, that you made work really well. But I am interested in, in the engine choice. You've already explained the, the reasoning behind the, the four cylinder. And on face value, when you're looking at the capacity and number of cylinders of the competitors and a thousand plus horsepower being kind of the norm, you're on face value at a, at a pretty significant disadvantage. When you look at that base 2AR engine that you are using, it's, it's again kind of a, a relatively low horsepower. I think one, 180 horsepower stock, is that about right? Yeah, I believe it's 186, yep. Yeah, okay, there, there are thereabouts. Uh, alloy block, alloy cylinder head, although twin cam. What are your immediate concerns about getting this thing to produce 1,000 horsepower with some level of reliability? So when we first started this project, the bar was definitely not 1,000 horsepower. It was five or 600. Yeah, good and, point. Yep, and with that size engine, we said, hey, 2.7 liter, we can make five or 600 horsepower reliably. We can do this. I didn't think it was a, a big challenge. I, think, I thought it was right up our alley. And uh, the original challenge was actually not making the horsepower. We made the horsepower relatively easily. The, the, we had a reliability problem with the valve train at RPM and under boost and backfiring, it would shoot off the rocker arms. So the first year it was uh, dealing with these valve train uh, challenges, but we were able to get through those into an extremely reliable valve train that we can you know expand on later if you want to talk about that kind of stuff. But, but the way the development went, it was, look, let's make 500 horsepower the first year. And then every year after that, we try to make another 100 horsepower. And then eventually when we made the horsepower that we wanted, we said, let's make another 1,000 RPM. We just evolved it a little bit each year, and then we would find a challenge and, and uh, try to design around it or design straight through it and replace it. 
All right, there's a couple of bits I'll, I'll just dive back into there. So it's a good point. Yeah, back back then, as you mentioned, you know, you're not at a thousand horsepower, and and certainly five to six hundred horsepower out of a two point seven liter four cylinder is, is is not at that point difficult. Certainly not very very hard today. One of the aspects though we do need to consider is it's, it's not just a horsepower number that that's relevant here, uh, which is so easy to forget about when you know we're, we're looking at um, you know dyno figures on the internet. It's also the the usable power band, and and that's I'm I'm guessing here there would still be some deficit with a four cylinder two point seven liter engine compared to a, a seven liter V eight in terms of the the low RPM response. Was that an issue, or or really just not a not a huge concern given the the uh, RPM range the car was was run through in in a a, a competition run? <laughs> we could talk for literally hours on just the development of that. 2AR four-cylinder engine. Uh, there was so much to unpack there, but with our understanding of electronic ECUs and uh, turbocharging and nitrous, the, the theory was we will use the turbocharger to get us to the power that we want. We will run the smallest turbocharger that we can make the horsepower with. So we would have the least amount of lag. In addition to that, we would add direct port nitrous that was controlled through the ECU. So you activate the nitrous, and we still run it like this today. And then once the driver got past 80% throttle, the nitrous would be active anywhere over 2,500 RPM. Once the boost came up, then we would turn the nitrous off and it would have the boost there. And we really wanted a, a long power band, a wide power band from 3,000 all the way up to red line at that point was, I think, 7,500 or something like that. Now it's closer to 9,000. And we were able to get that with the nitrous and the turbo, but you really had to understand how to build the engine so it could take it. You had to understand the electronics so they could be reliable and consistent. And since we had experience with all of that, it was a relatively successful uh, engine program. Okay. Let's just talk a little bit about the the nitrous sort of as, I guess we could call it a form of, of anti-lag just to get that turbo initially spooled. Obviously once the turbo gets past a certain boost pressure it sort of becomes self-sustaining and that nitrous isn't, isn't really required anymore. And, and there's a sense that we could put any size turbocharger on, on any engine and then just fix all of the low RPM response and lag by giving it a, a massive shot of nitrous. To, to a degree, yes, but uh, depending on your turbo size and compressor map, etc., if you drive a, a big turbocharger really, really hard at low RPM on a small capacity engine, uh, you do risk the potential to running the compressor past the surge line, running it into surge. Now, obviously, that's engine specific and turbocharger specific. Is there anything that you needed to worry about in the drift setup, or are you you just nowhere near that surge line? So we don't find that to be the case with nitrous. Uh, the nitrous is in increasing the amount of oxygen in the cylinder uh, without increasing a huge amount of the actual volume of air, right? Because it's such an oxygen dense, without getting into all the technicalities of it, which honestly, I'm not an engineer and don't totally understand. But from my experience, when we would shoot the nitrous down low, it wouldn't increase the boost very much. It, it would increase the en exhaust energy some, but there isn't a huge amount of exhaust velocity and volume increase with the nitrous. You're getting power because you're adding the extra oxygen and, and the extra fuel. And that would get us the extra torque. It wasn't necessarily making the boost come up sooner like you would on a think of an anti-lag. It's just making more power. Okay, so so the power is coming from the nitrous, and then the 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 response of the turbocharger still comes in later. And in terms of what I was talking about there with with surge, the the risk there is really driving the turbocharger, getting that that turbo speed up at very low RPM. And so obviously, as you're saying, that that's not what was happening. It was just the power and torque coming from the nitrous itself. Yeah, and we spent a lot of time on the dyno where we would test these different things. And you can go with a turbo only dyno run. And you'll go with the turbo plus the nitrous dyno run, and you look, you overlay the boost graphs, and they're quite similar. You might see a couple psi higher at lower RPMs, uh, but it's negligible compared to what you would you would think. Oh, at three thousand RPM, let's hit the nitrous, and we're going to get fifteen more pounds of boost. It's absolutely not like that. It there's not the turbocharger needs exhaust energy to uh, spin up the turbine, right? And you are getting a little bit more heat with the nitrous, but it, it just makes more power because there's just more energy pushing down on the piston, not necessarily coming out of the exhaust port and turning the uh, the turbine wheel. Okay. 
Right, let's just dive a, a little bit into these valve train uh, issues because I am interested in, in uh, learning a little bit more about what your fixes were for this. It's not an unusual issue. We see this with uh, the SR20 DE DETs really well known running a, a big heavy rocker assembly that, that isn't really located positively. Uh, later on with the SR20 with their VE cylinder heads they went to a shaft mounted rocker which was great because it couldn't get away on us. But um, the issue really comes around uh, particularly spending a lot of time on a limiter and if that limiter uses an ignition cut we can we can get some some sort of pretty nasty sort of popping and banging in the exhaust system which sounds great and, and people love that but uh, can, can you sort of give us an understanding of what that why that causes issues with valve train? Yeah so the valve train issues we had were specifically on the exhaust side and the configuration was you have a traditional uh, valve uh, with a lash cap on it, which is a small button that uh, is a barrier in between the tip of the valve and the rocker arm. Uh, and then uh, you have your rocker arm, which is free floating. One side of the rocker arm is sitting on a hydraulic lifter. The other side is sitting on that lash cap on the valve. And the cam is on top, essentially in the middle of it. You know, there's a ratio to it, but with a roller in the middle. And what's holding the rocker arm from falling off is the hydraulic lifter on one side and that lash cap and valve on the other side. What would happen when the car would backfire or you'd get an excessive amount of exhaust back pressure to the best that we could figure was two things could happen. You'd have the cam coming around trying to push the uh, valve open and because the valve would be very hard to open due, in, due to the high cylinder pressure, it could collapse the hydraulic lifter. Uh, when it finally opened the valve and the cam came around to the backside and it was time for the valve to come up, you'd have improper valve lash and the rocker could, could fall off. Uh, you can also have the same situation on the valve side where uh, if there's a, back a backfire or you know large pulse or high amount of back pressure in the exhaust, the turbo manifold, uh, it could hold that exhaust valve open slightly. Uh, and then when the cam went to close, it would uh, allow some lash or play on the rocker arm and the valve tip and that, that valve lash cap and things would just fall off. And so that's what we would have. The car would backfire, hit the rev limiter, and the rocker arms would just fall off and lash caps would fall off and they weren't being retained in any way. So that was the problem. Interesting, you mentioned the hydraulic lifter, which obviously in a production engine is, is pretty much the norm because it's maintenance free, there's no need to uh, adjust lash. And you, you've mentioned lash a couple of times, for those who may be unaware of that term, uh, that, that's essentially the, the clearance, if any, between uh, the cam and the, the rocker or roller or whatever it is, depending on the, the valve actuation. And um, normally we'll, we'll have some defined amount of clearance, not strictly with a hydraulic lifter arrangement, it runs uh, zero lash. But the problem being that in, in that situation you've just mentioned, uh, we kind of lose control of the rocker, the, the cam lobe's no longer contacting the rocker or the rocker's no longer contacting the valve and when that happens, when that rocker is, is not positively located, it, 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 can, uh, it can get out, which, which we don't want. The, the point I wanted to, to query there is uh, hydraulic uh, lash adjusters or lifters is pretty common in a competition application where maintenance is no longer really our, our pre uh, main concern to convert to a solid or mechanical arrangement. Uh, it sounds like you weren't doing that. You're still running the hydraulic lifters. Yeah, that first year we were running the factory valve train just because that's there was nothing else available. We said, hey, let's again back to the hey, let's get the car running, let's get to the track, let's see what the weaknesses are, and then work on those. Uh, unfortunately, that first year the weakness was so great. And it took so long for a solution that we just limped through the whole season, barely keeping the car running because it would happen to us basically every weekend. But uh, uh, an engine builder friend turned me on to a, a billet uh, rocker arm configuration with a solid lifter and uh, switching. And we also switched out to a larger diameter valve that then deleted the uh, the lash cap. It was a whole we stopped, We were basically just using the uh, cylinder and casting at that point because we had to change the guides, the valves, the springs, the retainers, uh, the, the the rockers, the lifters, 
And then we had to regrind the camshafts to a different profile to work with all of those those components. And and these components actually were designed originally for the Ecotech uh, drag team, the the, the uh, GM drag racing team that spent gobs of of resources. Uh, <laughs> eventually, I think ending up at like fourteen hundred horsepower or something like that with their their drag racing four cylinder. Well, interestingly enough. Uh, it's, it's strange how these modern vehicles and engines and even some of the suspensions seem to be very similar over different manufacturers. Well, the hydraulic lifters fit right into the lifter bores in our engine. The rockers were a close enough uh, rocker ratio that we were able to use them. And then we had a valve supplier. Uh, and, and now we use SuperTech, but initially it was a different supplier. Uh, make us some custom valves. Um and then some different springs as well. And we also had some help because, uh, I don't know if you remember the name from A Blast from the Past, which was uh, Chris Rado, who had a Scion TC that he ran in Time Attack. Well, those guys were also developing the 2AR a bit separately. Uh, and they had their own engine program, and once in a while, they would uh, we, would, we would share in- each other with some information. And, uh, th- or they sold me some parts and I'd kind of figure something out. And eventually uh, we all ended up with that rocker arm configuration, which was extremely reliable. And what we even run on, on Ryan's uh, Corolla 2AR engine today. So that essentially fixed that, put that, put that issue of reliability and the valve trying to bed for, for once and for all. It did. As we started going up in uh, horsepower and then eventually up in uh, RPM, we switched to a little bit different valve spring with uh, more uh, seat pressure and much more pressure. We, I mean, now we use these really high-end valve springs, the exhaust especially. We use these pro stock motorcycle, pro stock motorcycle valve springs that are only available from PSI Racing and they're like this unobtainium. They're not that crazy, <laughs> but they're, they're a very high, very high uh, spring rate in order to keep control over all of the, uh, the valve train on the exhaust. For whatever reason, that engine, that cylinder head, the exhaust cam train is hard to, to keep settled down and it requires a lot of spring pressure. I assume with the application though, the fact that the drivers are spending probably more time on a limiter than most conventional racing applications, that's going to sort of make make the situation more more obvious or much worse than it would in, in another form of motorsport. Yeah, it could, but I know that folks that were were, were road racing and also the very similar valve train design in uh, the early Scion FRS, the Subaru engine. And they were having a lot of rocker arms falling off as well. And I think it's just an early version of that sort of cam train. And the later engines use a very similar looking cam train. It's very similar in our B58 uh, super engine where it has the same configuration where you have a basically a floating rocker arm with a roller on it. Uh, but they got rid of the lash cap and there's a small little spring that connects and, and, and holds the rocker onto the hydraulic lifter. And we run those up to 8,700 RPM in stock valve train configuration. Uh, I mean, we have springs and, and uh, keep, and retainers and such, and valves, but the the cam uh, follower, you know, the, the rocker and the lifter, hydraulic lifter are, are factory and unmodified. You just mentioned something a, a moment ago about the cam profile. I just wanted to dive back into there. It's really subtle, but uh, can you talk to us about the differences between a, a cam grind for a factory hydraulic lifter setup where that rocker is, or at least it should always be in contact with the base circle of the cam and then the, the lobe as it turns around versus a mechanical setup where we have some actual lash clearance. It might be in the order of maybe eight to ten thousandths of an inch, but we've actually got that that clearance. So because a lot of people might think, well, I can convert my hydraulic setup to to solid. We've already got good cams that have been proven in the, in the hydraulics, so we'll run those and let's go. It doesn't quite work like that, does it? You're kind of at the limit of my understanding with cams. Uh, <laughs> we usually have experts, and I'll try stuff out and say, hey, this worked better, this doesn't. But uh, it has to do with the ramp, the rate of acceleration of the valve train as the cam lobe pushes down on the rocker and the valve train. And uh, if your rate is too aggressive, you can have some reliability issues. And um, it, it, that's it's more about, it's, there's more than just a bigger or a smaller cam. You're right, it has to do with uh, there's a lot of experience and, and fundamental understanding of 
what the valve train can handle as far as ramp rates on the way up and the way down. And they are different with hydraulics and uh, and solid. I, I think the point as well to sort of follow up with what you just said is, is you do not need to be a, a camshaft expert and a valve train expert in order to build a performance engine. The point I probably make here is uh, when you're making changes like that, it's really, really important to consult with whoever's grinding the cam and, and make sure that they understand what, what you've got, what you're doing, so that then they will be able to advise and then provide a, a profile that, that is going to be suitable to the application. Uh, another aspect with this 2AR, and I don't want to sort of do it to death, we've got a, a bunch of other stuff I really want to talk about as well, but uh, just in terms of head gasket integrity and, you know, even at the start with sort of five 600 horsepower, uh, when you're running that, that nitrous down low and then obviously as the power levels come up, you're running nitrous down low to, to sort of give the driver more bottom end torque. The cylinder pressures at low RPM around peak torque are going to be massive and that creates problems uh, quite often with heat gasket integrity. Um, what, was that sort of a, a major stumbling block for you and can you sort of let us know what solutions you're using on the current engines? Yeah, you know, it always comes back to the head gasket on these small displacement turbo things, right? Uh, honestly, it's still a challenge today. We just, uh, with Ryan's car with the 2AR, top qualified and won the event. But that Saturday morning, we changed an engine because we came we came in, uh, we, the car ran perfect on, uh, on Tuesday, the media day, then it perfect on Friday, and even on the dyno before that. And Saturday morning came around and we're doing our fluid checks and they pulled the radiator cap off. And, uh, and it was pressurized. And that's always an early sign of some sort of uh, uh, early head gasket issue. And it can just be a small pinhole issue, but it's, it's, it's only going to get worse. So we changed that engine out. And it, initially, we were running uh, the factory MLS multi-layer steel gasket with uh, like an off-the-shelf ARP bolts. And then we started having some, some leakage issues and some blown head gaskets. So the next step was to go to a more robust head stud. So we went with a half inch, uh, half inch 13, a, large, a larger diameter stud. Uh, and then we machined the block to accept that larger thread. And then we went up on torque. Um, that helped for a little while. And then we started having head gasket issues again. And then, so we went to a higher quality head stud, uh, which was there's like L19 or six. 25 plus where we were started to torque them up to like 165 foot pounds and then we would still have head gasket issues until we realized it wasn't the studs stretching or the head lifting it was literally the combustion chamber of the head deflecting like the base of the cylinder head wasn't uh thick enough for the pressures that we we're putting into that because imagine you know, however much cylinder pressure is pushing down on the piston is also pushing up in the cylinder head. And what was happening was it was deflecting the head. So what we started to do was we're running pins down through the cylinder head, the inner oil galley through to the through the coolant passage and reinforcing the the, the cylinder gasket mating surface of the head. Oh. Uh, so we were so essentially finding your own way to to make a thicker deck surface in that ceiling area, working with a production head. Yeah, yeah. So we were, we're literally near the limit of what you know that the casting can get to. And then recently, you know, in the last like four or so years, we're working with an Australian gentleman that makes this really trick, uh, like copper alloy fire ring. Um, that goes, we machine a, a groove in the block and that firing goes into that and it sits a few thousands proud of a copper head gasket so you get a much uh, higher uh, clamping force right where you want it around the cylinder and those have helped but but if we're having other issues with the cylinder moving or whatever, so we've gone to sleeved blocks but then away from sleeved blocks because we were having them drop and then we went to uh, back to stock sleeves, which were actually re really reliable. And so, honestly, we're still searching for that perfect setup. Uh, but even when we find a perfect setup and the thing is running two or three weekends, excellent, uh, you miss up on the, you miss the tune up a, a little bit and you get some detonation and boom, there it goes again and we'll blow a head gasket. So uh, when you're at that limit, any little problem can then cause a catastrophic issue. And, and that's, a bit of the problem with the engine at the moment is we're so on the edge that anything goes wrong and we're switching it out. Yeah, you, you definitely, you're walking a, a tightrope, I guess, 
a bit with with making that much power with with a two point seven liter engine compared to making similar power with much more capacity. It's obviously with more capacity, you don't need to be leaning on the engine so hard. Just mentioning detonation there, and I mean, it, it doesn't matter what pistons or conrods you're putting in the engine no matter how much money you spend nothing's going to live through detonation for an extended period of time so the key obviously is staying away from it uh, i'm guessing if you're you're running into potential problems there that you are still octane limited uh, with the fuel that you're running is is that the the case what what are you running what are you limited to yeah so uh fuel is fuel's open we run a ignite um uh, red uh, it's an ethanol blend. So it's basically E90. So we're in ethanol fuel. It has been excellent for us. Um, we are a bit limited on spark plugs just because it's a long reach plug, but the, we're starting to find a little bit better ones. Uh, but I th- we've got a good handle on the tune-up. We've got a good handle on the fuel. We've got a good handle on everything. It's just, you know, you get to a track and and sometimes it's hotter than it was. And you you know you want to run at the most boost and maybe turn up the nitrous and and we're getting to the point with the four cylinder where we're trying to extract as much as we can out of it and uh, sometimes we'll turn it up a little bit too much but the problem we had the the other weekend at Long Beach was probably uh, I'm thinking down to uh, an an assembly a build issue where we've used the cast cylinder head component too many times and rebuilt it too many times and we just we needed fresh parts. And, uh, and, and that's always something that I'm always figuring out and finding as you, as you, as you compete with these cars is what is the life cycle of the components? And I want them to last forever. (laughs) Uh, but, and you don't want (laughs) to replace them too soon. Uh, uh, and then, you know, sometimes you're just like, I don't know why this engine keeps blowing head gaskets, but this one does and the other one doesn't. So I'm just going to not use this anymore. And we're going to build a whole fresh new one. And that's what we're doing now. All right, I, w- I want to talk about maintenance in a second, but just before I do that, uh, you, you just mentioned about that that fuel, and I think you know, people feel that when they're running on an ethanol-based fuel, uh, p- particularly like a, a race product like that Ignite, that um, you're just immune from detonation. And, and yes, I mean, ethanol is a great fuel, but it's still not uh, completely immune, particularly at exceptionally high boost levels. The other thing I think people overlook as well is that uh, while the effective octane rating of an ethanol, ethanol-based fuel is very high, uh, alcohol-based fuels in general actually become uh, more more prone to pre-ignition which is another form of abnormal combustion so particularly that that occurs with or is more likely to occur with very rich mixtures so we still have uh, tuning related issues that we need to watch out for and and we're not immune to those I just wanted to, to add in that because I know that's a little understood aspect of ethanol in particular. Now, in, in terms of the maintenance schedule on these engines, I, a lot of people probably think, you know, now with every car that we see in a magazine or on the internet making a thousand horsepower, that's that's become the internet norm. And uh, I know a lot of people probably listening think that uh, they can modify their four cylinder engine and make a thousand horsepower and uh, do a hundred thousand miles be- between oil changes and all, the, all will be well. Uh, I mean, we've already understood from what you've said that that's not the case. But under general sort of circumstances, where you're not having a head gasket failure, you're not you're not burning a piston or something like that. What is your sort of maintenance schedule and swapping out parts on these engines uh, between rounds? Because obviously you've got a lot on the line here. Uh, you know, a, a DNF because of a mechanical is, is is not something that you want. So yeah, what what are you doing there? Yeah, uh, just real quick about the tuning setup. You know, one of the things that makes the, the the drift cars really challenging to tune is because the throttle and the cars are really, really dynamic. If you're going drag racing, even road racing, it's usually some kind of part throttle to full throttle. Drag racing is zero or full, and then you shift, you know, three or four times down the drag strip. Um, the drifting guys are on and off the throttle. They're part throttled. Nitrous is turning on. Nitrous is turning off. Boost is coming on. Boost is coming down. Uh, we have variable cams, so those those are moving. There's so much variability in the engine, and it's so much off and on very quickly. It's hard to get it perfect, and um, we can have knock, you know, every time, not every time, but the co- driver can get back in the throttle really quickly, and things are moving, and you can have like a knock knock real quick before the fuel, you know, gets into the cylinder. Like you can have this moment where it comes out the injector, it's not necessarily making it into that uh, combustion cycle. Yeah, combustion event, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and... and um, so you're and, momentarily very lean, essentially. 
Yeah, and so you can have these one or two combustion events where they are lean and you do get a moment of knock and, and sometimes that can lead to uh, uh, the beginning of a problem, a bigger problem. As far as maintenance schedule goes, we typically have two engines per car. We'll have the main, they're both main engines, they're both the same. And halfway through the season, uh, we'll put the second one in. So we'll have the, the first engine will be in the car, the second will be the spare, and then we'll get halfway through the season, we'll put the spare in, and then the, the, the second engine will become the spare. Uh, we've been developing now for years and we'll almost always have a third engine on the side that we're developing. What is it that we're trying to do? Trying to make more horsepower, more reliability in this, this area, more RPM, whatever it is. And so this third engine is being developed on the side. Once in a while, we'll put that third engine in, uh, either be at a dyno or at one of the events. Um, we'll then see if we got at what we wanted out of it. If we didn't, then we'll take it back out, back to the drawing board. If we did, We'll leave it in, and then we'll start converting the other engines to that spec. So it, it's not build an engine and just run it. Like it's a, it's a very robust engine development program that's happening in the background to not only keep these cars running, but to keep them uh, developed as well. Yeah, I guess the the target's always moving with the competition as well. So if you stay stagnant, uh, it's not going to take long before you start falling behind. A in terms of sort of a freshen up at the end of the season, are you literally throwing everything away and, and starting with every single component brand new? Or can you recycle the likes of the head casting and the block? Yeah, so we will have, uh, well, rod bearings would be the biggest wear item. Uh, so we can absolutely get a half a season out of it, which would be like four events plus testing and stuff. I think it would make it a full year, but it would be a bit of a stretch. There's just so much force, you know, on, and these, these bearings are not extremely wide and large. Uh, cause when you're dealing with large, st long stroke engines, there isn't a huge amount of room for a large rod pin and connecting rod within that, uh, within that crankcase. So we're a bit limited by the size of big end that we can put on the rod. And then also we're trying to get a lot of RPM out of these things. So we don't want a whole bunch of weight. Uh, so, so the bearings end up being relatively small for the horsepower that we're putting out. So those will be the main thing that would be wearing. R main bearings basically don't wear. We have excellent crankshafts nowadays that don't flex much. And uh, the blocks of these modern vehicles are excellent as well. Uh, so the crankshafts are, um, I'll still change the main bearings if we go through it, but they don't wear. Um, the, the crankshafts we've had now last, I think we have some Sunny Bryant cranks in the 2AR that might be approaching five or six seasons now, and they still come out. They have no cracks and they will be, you know, half a thou, under thousands of, of uh, run out. So they're excellent. The blocks themselves will typically go for mm, maybe a season, a couple seasons. We'll go a season and then we'll rebuild it and we'll go uh, 0.25 millimeters over because there is a ring set available for that. And then once we get out of that, then we'll trash the block. We'll need a new block. Uh, as far as the cylinder heads go, there's not much wear on it other than if we had a head gasket problem, we've got to machine it. And we'll pr probably get a couple years out of a cylinder head, sometimes three. Uh, valve springs typically don't wear or, or wear down or lose pressure much just because we're, we're a relatively uh, low lift cam. Uh, for what these springs were originally designed for, like pro stock motorcycles and stuff. So those do last a while. And then whenever we go through an engine, we'll put all new timing components on it. Ch the chain, the tensioner, all of the guides, uh, and the cam gears and such. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it's a professional engine program, so we, yeah, what you're talking about there makes complete sense. And you get the ability, when you do work at that level, to start a season with the confidence that engine problems, with, with the exception of the, the small things we've already talked about, should not be a, a, a consistent issue. Uh, let's come back as well to the, to the rod bearings. You've sort of talked about uh, the issues with occasional knock. So I want to clarify, as I said you know, earlier, you know, we can't build an engine to sustain to live through knock and I stand by that but I mean I'm talking here about sustained knock that's going to last for a few seconds not maybe one or two uh, individual engine cycles where knock has occurred and maybe uh, one or two cylinders so 
that that's that's uh, achievable. But the upshot of this really comes back to as well what you were talking about with the uh, the reliability of the the Conrod bearings, because when you do get one or two knock events, that that's kind of going to really spike the pressure in that cylinder, and that gets transferred down through the connecting rod, and that can give those rod bearings a, a bit of a hard time as well, sort of trying to essentially crush that oil film out of the way and and try and get a metal to metal contact. So is, is that another consideration or aspect of you, your your rod bearing? wear or life expectancy? I think it is. Uh, and we've now trended towards higher oil pressures, which can help that, you know, as most motorsport has tried to reduce oil pressures to have less parasitic losses from the pumps and such, uh, at the power and the type of racing we do, we're not concerned with that. We are more concerned with reliability. So I've had to untrain my brain uh, from some of the traditional motorsport trends. So you know, typically, you know, you'd say minimum of, you know, a 10 PSI of oil pressure for every thousand RPM. So for a 9,000 RPM, we want 90 PSI. But when you look at like top fuel cars and, you know, the high horsepower drag cars, you know, they're into the hundreds. I think they might be a couple hundred PSI oil pressure. So we were running 80, 85 before. Now we're getting closer to 95, 100. Uh, this season, we're probably getting closer to 100, 105. And I'm keeping an eye on the bearings to see if they get better. But we've also changed a no, new oil supplier this year, uh, Enios. So I, my, when we ran the Enios oil back with the NASCAR Scion TC, that thing was excellent. Like we would beat the heck out of that engine. We'd, we'd bring it back to Ed Pink for them to rebuild it, and they'd kind of look at it and put it right back together again. Uh, so, Perfect. so I think we're going to have some better um, wear. I think with uh, with the new these new modern oils, you know, the new modern oils. You know, you can run, you know, a zero weight, a zero fifty, and uh, and get more protection than if we were running like the old school twenty fifty, without all of the high oil temps and stuff like that. So there's still stuff that I'm learning, um, and I'm always keeping an eye on on whatever new products that we can use to help reliability with the car. I guess one of the benefits as well from the fact you've been running that same engine essentially for so long you've been seeing them come back from competition you're stripping them down inspecting them for wear and looking at how the components are sort of living under those conditions it, it gives you the ability to to start developing things like you said there the oil and the oil pressure you can get a direct back-to-back -back comparison between a, a change in oil or oil pressure and see how that's affected things versus you know your, your last setup, which most of us unfortunately don't get the opportunity to do. We sort of run one engine and and, and that's kind of it. So that that is a nice aspect with the development you you are undertaking. Uh, talking about development. We'll move on from the the two A R, and I, I want to talk about the the BMW slash Toyota B fifty eight and the A ninety Supra. And again, sort of as a, a long time viewer of your YouTube channel, it, it looked from the outset like you were probably one of the the sort of early movers in, in sort of embracing that platform. And when the A ninety was was first released, there was a lot of scepticism, particularly with the two JZ lovers and the Mark IV Supra and you know, why did they put a BMW engine in a Toyota, et cetera. Uh, I also see, I've seen this time and time again when a new platform is, is sort of introduced to the market, there's, there's sort of a reluctance, I think, for, for a lot of tuners and workshops to embrace a new platform and get involved. They'll often sit on the sidelines for a year or two until the aftermarket sort of plays catch up. And at that point, they, they might dive in, but they've obviously lost a couple of years maybe of experience on the platform You've kind of gone the opposite way, which brings its own challenges. So, so why why was it you were so quick to to get involved with that B fifty eight? Yeah, we have a, a different business model than a tuner, right? The tuner needs to have a customer come in, uh, request something, and then he needs to be, be able to deliver it. The problem with with a lot of a, a new platform like the B fifty eight or the the GR Supra was, I don't know if any tuning shop could guarantee anything, uh, so that would be difficult. Um, we we had this opportunity, at, you know, when the new before the the Supra came out, in order to get our hands on one of the engines and to um, to try to develop it. And obviously, we wanted it to succeed. And in the back of our head was basically like back of our heads was like, if this succeeds, potentially this could become our new drift engine. So we had a big motivation there as well. But we did put ourselves out there, right? Because we were filming that engine development process concurrently with development. So if we hit some roadblock that was insurmountable, 
we wouldn't have been able to comp- it w- <laughs> it would have been like hey what happened to that various video series so we would have had to <laughs> sort of explain that you know in some way of, of why did we we didn't succeed why we didn't succeed in that right so uh that was a str- stressful time but uh you know we wanted to use that engine and and that was important for that for Toyota at that moment and still today to to promote that car you know and and again we love I love challenges and and uh it was like a new engine that no one's ever built before to a horsepower that no one thinks it can do. Sign me up. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, we went through and I think that was what, why it was compelling to watch because you're like, yeah, absolutely. Dude, what are these guys doing? This looks like a fool's errand. I mean, I think that that's one of the, <laughs> the scary parts about putting yourself out there on YouTube or on social media in general, when you're doing something uh, essentially close to live uh, the, there's nowhere to hide and if, if things go pear-shaped well uh, that, that is what it is but I, and I think as well like you know we're you, you're just you're a, a real person here learning as you go and and sometimes you're going to potentially make mistakes or find a problem that you couldn't possibly have predicted so you know the, the reality of it is, is exactly what it is you know and these things don't always go smoothly and perfectly and um, from what I saw uh, that was actually pretty smooth it, it did work pretty well from the outset in terms of that B fifty eight platform, what what do you sort of see as uh, as the pros and maybe the cons of it compared to? Obviously, it's very difficult to not compare it to the two JZ, which now is sort of a it's a pretty archaic thing, although it still produces great horsepower. Yeah. So initially, uh, many folk were you know, obviously uh, upset. <laughs> I mean, this pretty. I think people were clearly like actually upset that Toyota didn't come out with a three JZ or some <laughs> yeah. you know newer variant of it. Um, and but Toyota is the term I, I use. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? I, I kind of separated myself from the from the discussion and said, you know, this is the car we want to run. Frederick has a, a long history with the Supra. Um, I like challenges, and this is what we have in front of us. So, so let's try it and let's share it with everybody and. Uh, and so the so the the project got started. You know, we um, uh, initially got a car, pulled the engine out of it, and I put it on a stand. And we couldn't even put it on a stand. I mean, <laughs> we had to figure out even how to put it on an engine stand because the timing cover was on the back of the engine where you normally mount it to, and you can't get the timing chain and all that stuff off. It was mounted, the, so you had to mount the engine to the stand by the side of the engine. Uh, so the, and there were special tools I didn't have. You know, it was it was an exciting moment to to get through that engine and get into it. And I used every experience that I had with building engines over the years, and all of the different resources that I had, friends, um, and giving them a call and saying, "Hey, this is what I've got in front of me. What do you think? What do you think?" And I just kept talking to different friends and and experts, and and they said, "Well, I don't know. This is what's worked for me in the past, or this is that." And eventually, I get input from a couple of different uh, experts and then come up with my own decision on how to move forward. And uh, what we decided was minimal, like which is my sort of fundamental thing. So let's use the stock crankshaft, let's use the stock bearings, the stock oil pump, let's just go with rods and pistons. Uh, the, the cylinder liner is like this plasma sprayed uh, steel on aluminum, so it's actually ferrous, but... Um, it's a very so you hard. You can't just go and uh, bore and hone that to a first oversize and put a conventional piston and ring set on it. Nope. So we designed the pistons around the factory rings. I knew the factory rings worked with that cylinder wall, so we didn't touch the bores. The head gasket and everything looked good, but we went with a better stud. And as far as the valve train goes, uh, we found out that it was the same as the uh, Mini Cooper b48 engine and super tech already had a very good valve train uh, valve and spring and 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 retainer combination for it so initially we went with that and then uh later on uh, very early on kelford cams out of new zealand uh had a, a good regrind on the exhaust they spent a, quite a bit of time trying to figure that out and then later on they had a billet cam that was available that we used uh but the, the first engines that we ran on the dyno it was okay what turbocharger did we need for a thousand horsepower Let's put that on there. And we just kept turning up the boost until we finally made the power. But the biggest limitation on the B58 initially was the integrated exhaust manifold where it has a six-cylinder engine. You'd expect it to have six exhaust ports, but it only has two. So it has a very restrictive uh, cylinder head 
uh, in order to do whatever they're doing um, to spool up the turbo or to have the engine heat up quicker or whatever. So that early engine was really challenging to get uh, to a thousand horsepower. But in 2021, the when they came with the new cylinder head for the GR Supra that has the the six exhaust ports, the thing made another 150 horsepower immediately. So, so now make, we make it something a bit more conventional. Yeah, now we make 1,200 horsepower on the thing in, in reliable form. I mean, I don't, I don't know the the full reasoning behind uh, that two exhaust the, uh, exhaust port sort of cylinder head variant. I mean, I think what is easy to overlook from the aftermarket standpoint is that manufacturers of these current generation of engines are, are very, very tightly restricted by emissions compliance. And you know, if, if you could see their list of priorities, uh, power and torque would probably be right down the bottom of that list or at least pretty, pretty close to. It doesn't really matter how much power or torque the engine produces or how wide the power band is. If, if it doesn't meet the emissions compliance regulations, it's never going to make it into production. So these are some of the things driving these new engines that at least back in the 2JZ era, uh, there were emissions compliance, no doubt, but uh, much less stringent. So do, does that sort of impact on where ultimately you see the B58 uh, engine design? And really, we're talking more specifically about the cylinder head. The, the block's really just there to support the pistons, rods, and crankshaft. It's the head that's sort of there for flow. But I mean, in drag racing terms, we're seeing... Teams with production 2JZ cylinder heads producing, you know, 2,000 plus wheel horsepower. Uh, is, is that something you'd ever see a B58 cylinder head being capable of, or is it just not got the, the base design to support that sort of level of flow? Yeah, understood. Uh, I mean, I think that the B58 cylinder head may actually be better than the 2JZ uh, head in the aspect of flow, because the 2J is not a good flowing head, especially when you compare it to uh, like a, a Honda VTEC head or something like that. It's actually quite poor. Uh, and they do need a lot of boost to make those uh, 2Js make, you know, 2,000 or more horsepower. So it, it's not a very good flowing head. It's a very strong block, and they're able to figure out uh, the head sealing on it relatively well. No, I, I, I think that you can make 2,000 horsepower out of, out of a B58. The challenge that the drag racers are having right now is that they are dry they are racing factory computer based supras with flash tunes or piggybacks or whatever and i think they're limited with the direct injection and the additional port injection and all these different systems that they're putting on the car these engines and they're not just going to a motorsport uh electronics fuel injection package like what we run if when someone so if finally, you put one of those engines in a, a proper tube frame rear wheel drive chassis with standalone engine management and a proper clutchless drag racing gearbox, hold on, that's what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think the limitation is the surrounding electronics and not necessarily the base uh, head and block. Although, um, the like most modern engines, uh, if not all of them, like these modern cylinder heads, they're trying to make the castings thinner. They're trying to get uh, the, the engines to, to warm up quicker. Uh, the cooling ports are larger, uh, which are creating a weaker cylinder head to gasket uh, that, that flange that I was talking about with the 2AR that we had to reinforce. Uh, that is potentially the weak link in the B58 cylinder head as well, you know, as you get past, you know, 12 or 1300 horsepower. But I think that there's going to be some solutions to that. You just have to figure out what those are. But Again, I think we're going to come down to some of the head gasket stuff because I've had some of the, the the drag racers here running the GR Supras um, hit me up to talk about some you know building some engines, and they'll they'll send me some pictures of what they've broken, and I'm looking at this like this is you're not having a engine builder issue, you're having a tuning problem because uh, <laughs> they're burning the thing down, and uh, and so I think once they get on the other side of that, um, then you're going to see the horsepower and the the the, the speeds uh, increase and the elapsed times uh, dropping pretty quickly. And they're already running, geez, nines with minimal mods and then eights with, with a bit more. And the amount of work that you have to do on a Mark IV Supra and a 2J to reach the quarter mile times of the Mark V Supra is, is quite different. You know, you have to put a lot more work into a 2J and a Mark IV Supra to get where the Mark Vs are right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, obviously, at the the pointiest end of you know sort of import uh, six cylinder drag records, we, we've still got the two JZ, and I foresee them being there probably for some time. 
Uh, maybe not least of all because those guys are going to stick to what they know and have developed rather than trying to start with something brand new. But yeah, it will, it will be definitely interesting. I mean, this engine essentially is still, relatively speaking, in, in its infancy. Coming back to its application in Formula Drift, you know, we've talked about 1,000 horsepower target for the, the 2AR. Now you've got more capacity and more cylinders. You're obviously going to be able to hit that target with a lot less stress on the engine. So the next question obviously is, do, do you step that target up? You already sort of mentioned, you referred to 1,200, 1,300 horsepower. Is that sort of that next target that you're, you're aiming for or is 1,000 give or take still kind of uh, enough to get the job done? I think 1,000 is enough to get the job done, even 900 at all but two tracks. So we have two big, bigger bank tracks, which is in Seattle and then Irwindale. And if you're on the right tire, which right now is the Nitto that we run and the and also the Ford guys run, uh, you need closer to 1,200 horsepower. When you have the grip turned up and you have the speed turned up and you're up on the bank, you're going to want that horsepower. And uh, and we've been able to get the, the B58 to that level. And so we're pretty much getting to the point to where we're not developing the B58 anymore. We're, we're, we're happy with where it is and we're continuing to develop other aspects of the car. In terms of that, is it a case of you know just give the driver enough to get the job done? So a thousand horsepower, nine hundred horsepower for all of the other tracks, and then you have the the Irwindale uh, tune up that gets dumped in for just that event where it where it's wound up to where it needs to be. Yeah, so it probably takes some explaining. Um, so the reason the where we would say we have enough horsepower uh, would be when the driver is on a, a higher speed, higher grip portion of the track. And he gets into the throttle and the RPMs accelerate and the wheel speed accelerates at the rate that we are okay with. Like he gets in the throttle and rip, 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 like he gets to the rev limiter. Like he can just make however much RPM he wants with his right foot. So at the slower tracks, you can imagine why would you want, just go think of extremes. If you have 3000 horsepower, every time you hit the throttle, it's just going to go to the rev limiter, right? So you don't want that necessarily. Um, and it would be hard to modulate that as well. So we want a, an amount of power that we can modulate, the driver can modulate, uh, that still has good low-end torque. So we don't want to give up that high RPM horsepower at the expense of too much low RPM torque. And then uh, if we find that he's in the throttle and he's sitting at 7,200 RPM and it just won't accelerate anymore, he probably needs more power. Um, or we've got to reduce some grip uh, in the car. And then... Really, this just comes down to, are you competitive and can you win events, right? We're not racing dinos here. But where no one's coming to the track and trying to make more power for the sake of making more power, we want to, we want to make more power to, to win more rounds. And the reason it will help win rounds is because the driver needs to have control over the rear wheel speed. And the more horsepower can help every time he gets in the throttle and he wants more wheel speed to help maybe get the car more sideways or drive the car down off the bank or whatever it is, when he puts the throttle, he gets that wheel speed. Um, so when we get to the level of horsepower we, where he feels like he's got enough uh, power to improvise his driving and do what he needs to do, then, then, then we're good. Anything beyond that is going to stress the engine more and potentially just spend more time at the rev limiter. And at that point, it's actually a little bit of a disservice because it's like a hard stop uh, with the wheel speed and you, you, it's better if the driver can have a more or less wheel speed with his right foot. If you're always sitting on the rev limiter, you can only have less, you can't have more. Uh, and then typically if, if that's the case, you'll go into a, 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 a different gear, a longer gear. You might change the rear end ratio. So you have more wheel speed, uh, or the same wheel speed with a lower engine RPM. So basically staying away from that, that limiter, and, and giving the driver the ability to vary the, the wheel speed up or down, that then gives them the, the ability to control the, the angle of the slide more, more or less is what you're saying? That's right. That's right. And then you can get to the point to where now you've got all this horsepower and you've got this really long gear and you've got a bunch of wheel speed, but your tires don't last two runs, two laps. <laughs> so that's the, that's the last aspect of it is, sure, you can build this ultimate setup, but the tires need to last two laps. And if they can't, then you need to turn everything down a little bit so the thing's not at a tire in the last turn and the car's not competitive. 
Yeah, I mean, really interesting to, to kind of get a deeper dive on perspective because I think from the, the spectator's perspective, you're not going to understand all of the intricacies that go into it. And yeah, I think to a degree, because these horsepower numbers always get chucked around, uh, I think there is a perception that simply more is, is better. And, and clearly, as you've mentioned there, there's a lot more that goes into uh, defining what that package should be producing in order to to be competitive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think we'll we'll probably move on from here because uh, we we are getting a little bit long, and I do want to respect your time here, Stefan. So I uh, will we'll move on towards uh, closing this thing off, and uh, we we do sort of have the same three questions that we ask all of our guests, a- and the first is in in terms of what what have you got on the radar in the future for yourself for Papadakis Racing? Is it just going to be more of the same, uh, more more formula drift action? Yeah, right now we're we're handling uh, three cars. So we do the GR Supra for Frederick, uh, the GR Corolla for uh, Ryan Turk, and uh, GR eighty six for Jonathan Castro. So that's pretty much the extent of what we do with the shop um i obviously do some youtube videos here and there i try to fit those in um and i want to and i do have some some content planned for this year uh but for the next i'd say two to three years uh that that's continued to be our our main focus beyond that uh it's hard with motorsport to to plan five or ten years out so uh you never know what's coming what's on the horizon correct yeah yeah so so uh, you know, every you know, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. Like every time I I say, okay, I've been d- drifting for a while. Maybe I should start considering, you know, doing something else. And I start thinking about something else. Like we have this resurgence or like this new, you know, re igniting of the the excitement of drift. And I think that happened again this year with the you know the kind of everything opening and tr- international drivers starting to travel a bit more. And now we've got a you know like Aston Martin from. New Zealand in Formula Drift, and we've got the you know uh, Federico from from uh, Italy with his Ferrari, and we've got the Japanese guys coming back in, and it, it's been uh, uh, it's a great start again. to the season. Yeah, so so it, it keeps it fun, man, and and uh, you know I love building all these cars and everything, but you know traveling and and all these years can drag on you, especially if you're not having fun. And, and fortunately, I'm still having a good time and, and spending uh, the weekends with drivers and, and crew and everybody that I enjoy spending time with. So, and the fans keep coming out. Like, I, I just can't believe like this short little story. Like I, I, I keep having younger fans of like the YouTube page coming up and like coming up to the trailer and meeting me and saying, Hey, you know, thank you for putting out the content. You really got me into, you know, working on cars and now I want to, you know, build race cars and get on a race team and doing this stuff. And, and, man, I remember being there at that moment when I was that age and then now kind of being that person that is inspiring people, you know, it's, uh, it, it makes me want to continue to, to do what we're doing and, and to not back off. I, I think it, it, yeah, it, you'll never obviously know how, how, many people you have inspired right through your whole career. But I mean, I, as I've mentioned already, you know, you and and the other people that were drag racing back in those early days in the nineties, you know, that that sort of sparked my passion for for motorsport and ultimately got me into drag racing. And your your YouTube channel again, the amount of information you put out there, and it's that sort of uh, you know, the, there's no secrets. It's it's very open and honest, which is refreshing these days because so many people try and keep everything to themselves and, and hide it behind a, a veil of, of secrecy. And uh, you know, I, I think that's a really refreshing ap- approach, which, which, as you've obviously seen, is, is helping get more and more people inspired. So uh, for, for all of those enthusiasts out there, uh, I, I really appreciate what you're, what you're doing. Now, in terms of uh, you know, your career, it's been fairly uh, extensive and you've been involved in a lot of different aspects of, of motorsport and obviously seen a huge amount of success uh, with everything you've been involved with. Looking back over that, is there sort of any advice you could give to uh, a younger version of yourself or a, an upcoming younger enthusiast looking to maybe follow somewhat in your footsteps that would fast track uh, your progress? Yeah, uh, advice for myself, um, geez, 
I, I, I followed my passion and uh, I, I think I did uh, my best at surrounding myself with, with good, um, with good people uh, that I enjoyed spending time with. So, so I'm happy with that. If it was, you know, to give advice to, to anybody, it would be continue to learn uh, not only the trade and the thing that you want to be good at, but also look outside of that as well and see where you can be inspired and where you can learn from what other people do in other professional um, arenas and learn from that to apply to yours. Because if if you have your head down and you're under the hood of whatever it is, your car or your shop or your scene or your group of friends or whatever, uh, it, it's been in my experience, it's, it's hard to become bigger than that and and grow beyond and, and really grow and blossom. Uh, you have to continue to learn from other. So I'll, I'll go to uh, off-road events and look at the off-road trucks and what they're doing with the Baja stuff and short course. And we race those for a little while. Um, try to learn, you know, I learned how airplanes are made and how, you know, how they design those parts or even reading books on professional um, uh, uh, cyclists and uh, how other professional uh, sports folks train and even taking some of those uh, strategies and having conversations with like Frederick Osbo and, and seeing if maybe we can apply some of those strategies into, you know, driver training and driver mental uh, toughness and things like that. And, and crossing over outside of our uh, specific sport, I think has helped a lot uh, in, in growth. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting angle. And yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it is very easy, no matter what you're involved with to sort of put your blinders on and, and just be sort of stuck in your own lane and, and really focused so much on on your own sort of course and direction that that it's easy to ignore everything else out there. And I mean, you know, not a lot of what we do, obviously when you're starting to develop a brand new engine, this is a little bit different, but not a lot of what we do in terms of motorsport is, is really new or cutting edge. And a lot of it's really been done before. So you know, if you can look at what others are doing in other disciplines of motorsport, and maybe apply some of those lessons, it, it can really fast track your your own progress uh, without having to, to learn all those lessons the hard way. And another element I will just add in here, uh, and, and we could have talked to you, I'm, I'm pretty sure, for another two hours, but again, as I said, I, want, I do want to respect your time. Uh, what I've seen, and this is, is deep on your YouTube channel, is your application of more modern technologies. We didn't get to dive into it, but the likes of uh, CAD design for roll cage manufacturing, uh, CNC bending and notching of those roll cage components and then also uh, you, you're quite deep now into the technology of 3D printing of inlet manifolds and, and canal exhaust components which I find really really fascinating but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hold that conversation perhaps for another day so I guess uh, the upshot of all of this uh, if we sort of paraphrase is uh, don't be afraid to, to sort of look outside of your own lane and, and see what else is happening in terms of technologies around you and uh, apply uh, if possible you may end up fast tracking your, your own progress. All right, last question for today. If people want to find out more about what you're doing, uh, if they're not already following your YouTube channel, social media, where can they head to? Yeah, so I, I post on two main uh, places. It'd be Instagram, and that's at, at Steph Papadakis, S-T-E-P-H. Uh, and just you know Google my name. I'm sure that stuff would come up. Uh, and then YouTube. And yeah, man, that's about it. I'm hard to get a hold of. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can send me emails on the contact of the PapadakisRacing.com website. And, uh, but we don't work on customer cars or anything like that. So I don't know if I can't really help you with your project, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm busy spending time trying to find time to build YouTube videos that I could, you know, share as much information as I can with everybody. So yeah, man, I, I, thanks for having me on. And, and uh, I hope I, we should do this again someday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, as I say, we could could have probably talked for another couple of hours, and and, and no doubt at another point uh, we we may be able to do that. Uh, as you mentioned there, I'll just clarify: not a commercial tuning or performance workshop. You're you're very focused on your in-house projects. So uh, those listening, uh, don't don't email uh, Stefan asking for a turbo kit for your Honda Civic. It's, it's not going to happen. But uh, by all means, please do follow along uh, with his social media channels, and we will uh, drop links to those in the show notes to make those really easy to find and as I say as well you're pretty active with uh, 
replying to, to comments as well. So that's probably the best place to, if you've got questions on the YouTube videos, etc., cetera, uh, ask away and uh, hopefully Stefan can find the time to get back and reply. All right, again, thanks very much for coming on and I uh, really appreciate your time. It's been a great chat and hopefully some real good insight for those who have been listening. Thanks for having me. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 70 $75 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires. You can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum, which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.